State of Palestine an emergency meeting of the League of Arab States at the level of foreign ministers in Cairo in the next few days. <clears throat> Regrettably, history for some media and politicians start when Israelis are killed. Our people have endured one deadly year after another. We came to the Security Council month after month, warning of the consequences of Israeli impunity and international inaction. Last October, about a year ago, we stated before the Security Council the Palestinian people will be free one day or another, one way or another. We chose the peaceful way, the one the international community advocates for. Do not let Israel prove us wrong for our sake and theirs. This is not a time to let Israel double down on its terrible choices. This is a time to tell Israel it needs to change course, that there is a path to peace where neither Palestinians nor Isra Israelis are killed. And it is the one diametrically opposed to the one Israel is embarked on. Israel keeps saying the blockade and repeated assaults on Gaza are to destroy Hamas, military capabilities, and ensure security. Clearly and, ex and expectedly, its blockade and assaults accomplished neither. The only thing they did accomplish was inflicting terrible suffering on an entire civilian population. It is time for an immediate end to the violence and the bloodshed, and it is time to end this blockade and to open a political horizon. When Israel now tries to justify yet another assault by the same faulty premise, no one should say or do anything to encourage it down this path. We know only too well that the messages about Israel's right to defend itself will be interpreted by Israel as license to kill, to pursue on the very path that led us here. 370, and the number is rising by the moment, of Palestinians that have been killed already in one day, including children, some barely a few months old. Entire families were killed in their sleep. Will this bring security? Will this advance peace? Where is the international protection the Palestinian people is entitled to when the occupying power violates international law and harms those it is obliged to protect? Aren't Palestinians' lives worth saving? The Palestinian civilians killed, the Palestinian children killed in occupied Palestine could have been spared. Isn't that a moral and legal obligation and a contribution to peace? Why nothing is done when those killed are Palestinians? We need to think hard of what logic we want to see prevail here. If this is about vengeance, then many Palestinians will feel they have much to avenge. If this is about peace, then the way to it is not through further entrenching 
oppression and occupation, but by ending it. You cannot say nothing justifies killing Israelis and then provide justification for killing Palestinians. We are not subhumans. Let me repeat, we are not subhumans. We will never accept a rhetoric that den denigrates our humanity and reneges our rights. A rhetoric that ignores the occupation of our land and oppression of our people. There is no right to security that trumps the right of a nation to self-determination. The fulfillment of our right to self-determination is the only path towards shared peace and security. We chose the peaceful path to achieve our rights, but Israel continued using blunt force against Palestinian lives and Palestinian rights. Israel cannot wage a full-scale war on a nation, its people, its land, its holy sites, and expect peace in exchange. One needs to address the root causes of the conflict. And by doing so, we will be addressing its consequences. We have been calling for a different rationale, a different approach. Justice, not vengeance. Freedom, not occupation. Peace, not war. Our calls should be heeded. The alternative is playing out under our very eyes. Israel has announced dozens of times that it had handled the Palestinian problem by war against our people or peace with others. Since 1948, till a few days ago, in the statement of Netanyahu in front of the General Assembly. Netanyahu held during that speech in these United Nations a map denying the existence of Palestine, a map of aggression and annexation. To all the peacemakers, to all those who believe in the UN Charter and international law, one cannot lose sight of the bigger picture. We need to stand up for the vision enshrined in the resolution of the Security Council and the General Assembly, and to take the necessary measures to ensure compliance with their provisions. We need to uphold international law, not abandon it. Everybody in the room behind me, who will be meeting in a few minutes, agree on the end game. Israel expects and demands political and military support while advancing goals that are fundamentally at odds with international legitimacy and consensus. Its policies are an assault on our humanity, on international law, on peace, and are a threat for its own people. Can those supporting Israel ignore its colonialist and racist agenda? That would be self-defeating. A different path is possible. I repeat, a different path is possible. But it cannot ignore the lives and rights of the Palestinian people. It must guarantee them equal measures of freedom and security. You cannot stand for peace if you do not stand up to occupation. Do it because it is the right thing to do, morally, legally, politically, and because it will save lives. Peace will save lives. 
because it is the only way forward. I thank you very much. We have copies for those who are interested to give it to you. Thank you. And have good afternoon. Was the Palestinian yes, yes, ambassador to the United Nations speaking ahead of a Security Council emergency meeting. Let's bring in Shihab Ratanzi, who's covering developments for us at the UN. Shihab, Riyad Mansour had a calm but strong message calling for an end to the blockade. What more did he say? And, of course, his comments come ahead of that emergency meeting. And one hour after, the, the Israeli ambassador to the UN spoke at the same spot. But this is a very different message. This was a, a statement rooted in the historical context, in the context of international law, and the context of UN Security Council resolutions, UN General Assembly resolutions, and what he said were repeated warnings at the UN Security Council that Palestinians, in his words, would, would be, will be free one way or another. Mansour there, though, still saying there is a way to peace, that the, the Palestinian people will be free one way or another, but there is still the time for Israel to change course. There is a path open to peace. But he also then asked the international community, of which clearly the UN Security Council is representative, where is the protection that the Palestinian people are entitled to when an occupying power is abusing them? We are not subhumans, he said, and then he repeated that. But he said, look, this is not the time for vengeance. This is the time to uphold international law, not abandon it. Now, an hour ago, we heard from the Israeli ambassador, who said that this current operation was Israel's 9-11, and from now on, nothing will be as it was. Then he said, and this is quite, quite interesting in the context of wondering what Israel may do next, every inch of Gaza has become part of the Hamas war machine. Israel will exact a heavy price on Hamas. So clearly, when we're talking about vengeance and when we're talking about international law, international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions, these are rather concerning, concerning statements when it comes to proportionality. But both, both the Israeli and the Palestinian representatives of the UN speaking ahead of that UN Security Council meeting, which is supposed to begin in about 10 minutes, 10 minutes' time. Shihab, just on that Security Council meeting, what, if anything, are we expecting to come out of that in terms of a de-escalation? We can only sort of try and do the sort of Kremlinology of the UN context of that, which is, OK, well, what exactly is happening in 10 minutes? Initially, this was supposed to be a private meeting of the UN Security Council. So that is actually a formal meeting of the UN Security Council behind closed doors, but which the Israeli and Palestinian representatives could could participate in. That was then changed, apparently, at the request of some members of the UN Security Council to close consultations. So that's not a formal meeting of the UN Security Council, and only members of the UN Security Council can attend, and we expect them to be briefed by the current special coordinator for the UN for the Middle East peace process, Tor Wenesland. So I guess what we think is going to happen here is this really is a briefing. This isn't going to be the grandstanding that we might see in a public meeting. And and this isn't going to involve the Israeli and Palestinian representatives even, but this is going to be, I, I, this is what we're, we, we, we're gleaning. This is what's going to be the UN's perspective on what's happening and the realities on the ground right now, from which then I think we can expect the UN Security Council to act. We've been checking. We haven't seen any formal statements or any draft statements being circulated amongst members for consideration. So we do seem to be at a very early stage of the UN Security Council's deliberative process. OK, thanks so much. And we'll cross back to you throughout the evening with an update. She had Ratanzi at the United Nations. Let's cross to Ramallah now, where Imran Khan is standing by for us with some developing news. Imran, tensions are high tonight. What's the latest on the ground in Ramallah? Well, as you heard Riyad Mansour there talking, he said, as I'm speaking to you, uh, Palestinians are dying. As he was speaking, two Palestinians were actually killed in Kalandia checkpoints. Uh, the Israelis use live fire at Kalandia. Kalandia is the main crossing between Ramallah into uh, Jerusalem. Uh, there were some minor protests going on. The Israelis actually used live fire and two people were uh, actually killed. In the last 20 minutes, I heard ambulances race down to Kalandia. It's really not that far away 
from where I'm standing right now. That comes about an hour earlier in Jericho. Another Palestinian was killed. Uh, he was killed uh, by live fire. His body's already actually been buried. And there's been a fourth in Hebron. These all been happening as the UN Security Council uh, is about to meet, as the Israeli uh, representative to the United Nations was talking, and as Riyad Mansour was actually speaking himself. This is a very serious uh, development within the occupied West Bank. The occupied West Bank, I'll just recap very quickly, has been out on strike uh, in support of Hamas. People have been protesting here in Ramallah across the occupied West Bank, but the Israelis have been using live fire on some of those that are protesting. So clearly, uh, the Israelis are uh, trying to keep a lid on events in the, in the West Bank. But what they're doing effectively by killing these people is inflaming tensions further. Also, within the occupied West Bank, they've actually stopped Palestinians moving from one place to another. You can't get from Bethlehem, for example, to Ramallah. Uh, you can't get from Jenin. You can't get outside of Hebron. The Israelis have got a very heavy security uh, presence here. But it's this use of live fire against unarmed protesters that's now incredibly concerning within the occupied West Bank. And you've been painting a picture of Ramallah this evening. What's it like there in terms of public, um, public pe people being on the streets, for example, or people in their homes? What are you hearing anecdotally? Well, I'm just hearing the same thing in different ways, but the, literally the same thing from most people I've spoken to. And it says that, yes, we are surprised by what happened, but we're not surprised. If uh, you treat people like animals, then you should not be surprised that they fight back. And that is the real sense of what's going on here. People are surprised by what's happened, but they are sympathetic towards Hamas and what they're doing. OK, thank you so much for that update. That's Imran Khan in Ramallah. I want to bring in Al Jazeera's senior political analyst now, Marwan Bashawa, who joins us live from Paris. Plenty of moving parts to this story tonight. Uh, plenty of breaking news. We've heard Israel's Knesset has just declared the nation is officially at war. We've also heard from the ambassador to the United Nations from the Palestinian ambassador's perspective and also from the Israeli perspective. I'm not sure if you were able to listen to both of those press conferences, but certainly a, a, a stark contrast in the messages coming from both of them, Marwan. Uh, yeah, absolutely, because, uh, uh, you know, this war has many fronts, right? And one of those fronts is the diplomatic front. And what you will see in the United Nations in the days and weeks to come is probably more of the same that we've seen in the many years uh, before, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a very conflicting uh, uh, messaging uh, on, on both parts, uh, while the Palestinians continue uh, to underline the importance of the uh, root causes of this issue, the historic uh, injustices that the Palestinians fa face, uh, Israelis continue to talk about security and to talk to about themselves as victims of Israeli terror, uh, about Palestinian terror, as it were. Uh, but all in all, uh, what we have is diplomats trying to score points at this point, right? I mean, while, yes, they try to make points as well, because they are also speaking to an international audience, trying to defend their causes. But at this stage, they are certainly trying uh, to score points. And just briefly before we let you go, Marwan, where to from here? We're seeing Gaza's night sky being lit up with airstrikes. Are we likely to see a heavy civilian death toll going forward on both sides? Absolutely. I think Israel is bound to overreact. There's going to be a disproportionate use of force. And clearly, the way it's bombarding from far, it means there are going to be uh, huge civilian casualties among Palestinians, uh, no less uh, because this is uh, this so-called casualties of war is on the mind of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who certainly wants the Palestinians to pay the price for what happened over the weekend. OK, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. That's our political analyst, Marwan Bashara in Paris.